Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Men of the House podcast. And on today's episode, we have Mariela de Santiago. I hope I said that right, or close at least. And today we're going to talk about motherhood, entrepreneurship, the challenges of being a stay-at-home mom, all that entails. And so this is especially for the female listenerships, but also for our male counterparts, so we can learn better how to support our significant others, especially once children start becoming involved, it changes everything. How are you doing today, Mariela? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Awesome. I'm excited to have you. As I was stating before I hit the record button, my wife's best friend is the mother of two little ones, and they are like two and three, very, very close together and a handful. And with the husband being an entrepreneur and working quite often, she's often left kind of isolated, stay at home mom to deal with everything. So that was definitely one of my motivations in booking you through Podmatch and having this conversation because I get to hear the struggles firsthand. And I think it's a very important topic. And we as men, I think, can learn a thing or two on what our counterparts are feeling and how to best support them. But start off giving us a little bit about your background and kind of how you ended up in this space and how we ended up in front of each other talking about this topic. Yes. So I had my son back in 2022. I was a special ed teacher up until I had him. And then after having him, my husband and I decided that it was just best for me to stay home. It was what I wanted to do. Also, just with the financial aspects of child care and maybe and me not wanting to go that route it made sense for us. We were able to do it. And I'm so, so happy. I know that not every mom wants to do that. And sometimes it does have to be, uh, you have to weigh the pros and cons, right? Are you making more financially to justify not staying home if you want to go to work or vice versa? So, you know, everyone has to do what's best for them. But in my case, I wanted to do this. This is what I, my full-time job, I guess you can call it, it's more than full time. It's my everyday job. <laughs> it's your life. There are, yeah, there are no breaks. Um, and even nap time. Nap time is like the okay, I gotta hammer down and get through my checklist. But we I'm sorry. So having my son, I I really do not like the term stay at home mom, but I think that there is no other term that we really use right now that describes what we do. I like to call it raising a human, because that's what we're doing is we're bringing our kids up to be good humans that participate in society and we get to teach them values and morals and communicate the way that we feel is best and not doing that in like a childcare nanny or an au pair setting. So yes, from there, that was when I started my podcast called New Mom Talk Podcast because I found that I was on Google, Googling everything, anything and everything, you name it. And it is a lot for you to be sleep deprived, to -hmm. be feeding a little human every two hours and to be Googling (laughs) because you've never done this before. So I did that. And then I also was one of the first out of my friends to have kids. So I didn't have a mom community and it can get lonely if you don't have that. So from there... I was able to connect with other moms through other mom groups. I have a mom group myself called Carl's Bad Mom Crew, where I bring moms together, share resources, share local businesses and services that might be supportive for moms. So in a nutshell, (laughs) that is what I do. And it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of work. Now, was was kind of so starting any of none of this was kind of on the radar it was kind of like okay I'm gonna become a stay-at-home mom and this is kind of what we're choosing to do and then as you kind of felt the strain of that you were one of the people who you know I, I think it takes a it takes a certain kind of person to open up and be vocal about it 
and maybe say, whatever's happening is not okay. And it needs to change. And I have to figure out how to change it somehow, uh, be it through a podcast or a mom group and whatnot. <clears throat> but you now, do you, you have a business around this or do you have a business that's separate as well? This, so my business is I've, the business and then the two brands and my two brands are my podcast and my mom group. So I do work on building those and I run it all. I'm a one person team working on also expanding my mom groups, but yes, you made a very valid point that it wasn't something that was on the radar. Like I didn't intend to do any of this, but being that I had always worked from the age of 15, I couldn't just sit home. Not that I'm sitting, but I couldn't not do anything. Like I needed my brain to do something. And I, I saw a problem, which is like, I was on Google way too much. And then I was trying to figure out if these articles were actually credible people and it was yeah. too overwhelming. So I was like, I can't be the only person that is doing this. Like I'm not the only mom that's on Google <laughs> at all hours of the night. So I decided to find a solution by essentially providing those answers with guests that have that evidence-based knowledge to actually say, mm -hmm. here's what sleep training is. Here's what you need to know. Take what you will from it. Here's what you need to know about nursing, about feeding babies, about <laughs> anything and everything, right? You're always on Google for, oh my goodness, like am I doing something wrong? Should I be having my baby stay in their crib at two months? And I think when you are a first time mom, you take in a lot of the information from other moms about like, this is what really worked for me. And so some mm -hmm. moms swear by that. And I didn't like that because not that there's not one answer to everything. Like my child has a very different personality from other kids his age and vice versa. So my kid was in his crib at two months. He wasn't in the bassinet. So I have to kind of, I like to just be able to provide the actual evidence-based information that somebody needs that can then allow them to make the decision for what works best for them. That makes so. sense. <clears throat> yeah. I, I think about it because we have a 21, a 20, and a 10 year old. And so when you look at the difference of information from that many years ago, the internet resources available and kind of what stuck out was what you said about this mom swears by this because it worked for them. Yes, that could be true. But at the same time, we're like you said, we're raising little humans, little people to go out and they're all very different. And so I think there is like some baseline of anything like in health, there's some baseline evidence-based practices that are good. And then you can kind of make a decision and build from there, decide from there how you want to structure or proceed with contributing to the development of your child, I guess you could say. But coming from your background as a teacher and going into a first-time mom situation, what were some of the, let's say, discrepancies or kind of where was the information gap wide a part of maybe what you thought about motherhood and children because you had a career that kind of involved children to when you left that behind and actually having your own child? How was that different and what is something that you learned? I'll start off with saying when I heard stay at home mom, I always thought, Oh my goodness, that is the dream job. Like stay at home moms must have it so easy. Their house is spotless. They can cook whenever they want. Like they are able to work out whenever they want. No, no, it's actually the opposite <laughs> because you can't just like leave your child, right? And I guess I didn't realize that until I became a mom. Like you can't just like leave your, not that you're leaving your child unattended, but like they can't play independently for two hours. They right. need a lot of, stimulation and, and they need you to interact with them. And you're also just talking to them is teaching them how to 
verbalize and, and they're learning all the time. So my house is never clean. The laundry is always, there's always a pile of laundry and I'm lucky if I can get a home cooked meal. So most of the time I do things that will save me time, like pre-cut veggies. Mm -hmm. So it was the complete opposite of what I had pictured stay at home mom's lives to be. And it is much harder to, <laughs> so I do feel like maybe moms didn't, I didn't give moms quite the credit that they deserved. There was another with, even though I taught more of the middle school and the high school, I did see that sometimes parents had a big gap with their communication. Like, no, but they weren't always on the same page. So if I called mm -hmm. one parent, the other parent didn't know. And I get it. We're, they're all so busy. So one thing that I try to do is my husband and I always are on the same page. We talk about like what our goals are with our son, how, why we choose to do certain things with him and not certain things. Like for example, certain phrases, we do not like the phrase, oh, you're okay. So if he falls and he's crying, we never say, oh, you're fine. Oh, stop crying. You're okay. All right because we want to validate his feelings. And if he's crying, like cl clearly he's not okay. And maybe all he needs is a hug. So that was one thing that I, I did notice. And that I think I brought a lot of like these things that I saw in teaching with, with communicating with parents and really wanted to not have that. Other things, I mean, it it is a little bit difficult because again, I taught older kids, but from my experience, whenever I like did babysit because I babysat all through college and my master's degree. And when I was first teaching that homes were always messy and I was so shocked because <laughs> why don't you just have your kids put the toys away? Well, because yeah. maybe your kid is having a tantrum and really what they need is a nap. And I just didn't know that because I wasn't a parent. Right. And so it is a lot of like learning. I list, I love to listen to parenting books that is providing the new evidence, the new data, the new information. Because one thing that I don't like is whenever you hear older generations say, well, I did this and my kids turned out fine, or my parents did this and I turned out fine. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's great. Mm -hmm. I'm Did glad that you, you turned out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Whose standards are we using? Right. <laughs> but it's more of like, well, just because you turned out fine, maybe like you, there's still trauma that maybe you haven't like uncovered. And I don't want to do it that way because it's not really proven to work. Like, I don't want to just, we don't spank kids anymore. Well, it's because it clearly didn't work. All we're doing is instilling fear of if you do this thing, you're going to get physically hurt. You're not actually teaching a skill of like right. why they shouldn't do that. And why? Yeah. So things that we do is, I learned this from teaching, is giving options. So not saying you're going to do X, Y, Z because I told you so. I also hate that phrase because I told you so. We give options. So my son is two, but we always give the options so that the outcome is what we want. For example, with picking up the toys, do you want to pick up the toys by yourself or do you want me to help you pick up your toys? He's got a little control there, right? It's not mm -hmm. very much, but he's going to pick one of the two and he does. Or with like potty training, that one is a struggle. So right now we have a timer and then the options are, do you want to run to the potty or do you want me to pick you up and take you to the potty? Again, not a fun thing that he has to learn, but it's right. he's got the control of determining how he's going to get there. And I think that's a big benefit and something that I think was like the biggest takeaway with my background. Yeah, man. Should have started this 10 years ago maybe 20 years ago, <laughs> have this information, but it, it probably wasn't there. Like I know this stuff is, it just, it changes all the time. Like 
we you evolve. Re- we evolve. Yeah. I guess you learn, what is it, probably 10 years down the road, you can learn like what the burn pits in Afghanistan were harmful and are now causing cancer. And I'm sure it's the same with parenting techniques and styles is that the way the boomers did it and everybody else in between, it's slowly evolving. Technology wasn't where it is. And kind of like you said, the spanking thing. And and I even think one of my approaches is some people are like, well, there's always this, this excuse of they're a child, treat them like a child. Yes, yes, I agree. I know there's developmental things that they can or can't understand. But at the same time, too, you got to remember that they're little people. This is what we're raising. Little people to grow up and hopefully be good human beings, productive, contribute, good thinkers, kind, loving, caring, compassionate for their fellow man. And so there's always, of course, I think that discrepancy of when do you start being truthful with your child versus maybe pulling the wool over their eyes or not telling them the full truth about something. There's benefits and there's comprehension at certain ages, I'm sure, but there's at some point you have to learn, you know, every parent's going to have to go through that and face, hey, at what point are you honest with your children? And of course, as time goes on and we learn more about the brain and parenting and whatnot and what's good for people and mental health and what we're trying to accomplish here, I think the better we can do. Yeah. And there's a lot, right? There's always, you just, you're hoping that whatever you're doing, you're just teaching them to be good humans, that they are grow up to be confident, that they can verbalize for themselves, speak for, speak for themselves and also be just kind individuals that can stand up for others that can't stand up for themselves. Yeah. Right. And like mm-hmm. be able to see differences and be accepting of those differences. How you mentioned you and your husband kind of staying on the same page and what you want for outcomes with your child. How, I mean, of course it, it takes a willing participant. How has he been in terms of reception and kind of what are some of the things maybe you guys discuss if he's the one that's kind of away every day and how does he come in and kind of help support when you need some time alone and maybe he comes home and you've been at it all day? Yeah. So we have, the benefit is that my husband works from home. (laughs) So his commute is usually to pick up our son Mm because when he wakes up, our son wants him. So that is a big, big benefit is that my son always gets to see my husband, even if it's just walking by. Um, So most of the time, if my son, if my husband is taking a break, he can come and interact with us and see what we're doing and why we're doing a certain thing. Because I like to listen to a lot of parenting books, I usually go over them with my husband and I explain like the reasoning of why they suggest doing certain things. Like one of my favorite books is Good Inside by Dr. Becky. And she talks, it's it's better for kids that are a little bit more in like grade school, but just talking about like validating feelings. So when a mm-hmm. child cries, not to like shut it off or ignore it, but to really validate and to speak to them at their level so that you can also start to build that trusting relationship. Because I think naturally the way we grew up, like you we would cry or something was frustrating us and our parents would get frustrated. And it was just like, you were grounded or go to your room or right. The response was not what you I'll give you a reason to cry. Yes. And terrible. (laughs) What you really needed was just your parent to hug you and to say, Oh, that, that must've been really scary or, Oh my goodness, you must feel really sad. How can I help you? Or like, even let's say you break I don't know, a lamp that is really meaningful. And then rather than being yelled at, they just need to kind of like sit with their feelings. And then later on, when they come to, you can talk to them about like, oh, well, maybe we shouldn't be playing by these areas that are have breakable items, right? Like having to, being able to find a solution later on when they're mm-hmm. mentally capable. It's kind of like us, like when we're frustrated and we're arguing with somebody else. Like, how do you feel when somebody tells you to calm down? 
<laughs> right. That only makes you even more upset. But when you like have time to step away from that frustrating situation and can come back to and then really talk about this is how I felt. This is why now let's find a solution. It's so different. Kids are the same. Like, they're not much different. The only difference is that they literally have zero control over their daily life. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and want it just like we do. Yeah. And, and you know, just like us learning to self-regulate when our day doesn't go as planned. What have been some of the ways that you kind of make time for some self-care in the midst of all this chaos? What what tools do you enlist? I mean, I'm sure your husband's got to be a big help, but how, how do you kind of create some time, some self-care routines that kind of keep you going in the midst of all the craziness? Yes. So as you know, running a podcast is a lot of work, right? And yes. having a business is a lot of work. So I do what I can during his naps, but every single day, my priority during his nap time is to get a 20 to 30 minute workout in. I do, whether that's biking, yoga, running, whatever it is, I make sure that that's something I fit in. And if the house is a mess, it's a mess. I'm not going to even touch it until later on that day because I know myself and I know that if I go and I do a load of laundry or full laundry and do the dishes, but then my son wakes up and I didn't get a workout in, I'm not going to feel calm or like I was able to give something to myself. Like that workout for me is like my Zen. It's my mm -hmm. time to be able to step away from everything and give myself what I need. But even aside from that, like I know the the benefits of working out, right? It just makes you feel better. You're more alert. You are, you have more energy, which you need a lot of energy for a toddler. Oh my goodness. You do. <laughs> Let me tell you, coffee does nothing. Even at three, <laughs> I'll take a shot of espresso. <laughs> Shots are also different now, right? So yeah. a shot of espresso does nothing at three. So there's that. But I also have family nearby that can help. And if you have family nearby, I highly recommend seek that support. So once a week, I'll have help from a grandparent for about three hours. Most of that time is actually for me to work, but it still then opens up my nap time to do a little bit more. Sometimes that means I'm going to do a 30 minute show or I'm going to watch Bridgerton today yeah. or I don't know, Emily in Paris or maybe some trash TV and 90 day fiance, whatever. Like, I just need a little break, right? So I kind of have to sit and determine, like, what is it that I need today? I also will let my husband know in advance if I want to go and get a pedicure that week. Like, hey, can we look at your schedule? When can you be done, let's say, at four so that I can go and get a pedicure and then... I'll have like everything ready for dinner and ask for his help on certain things. Like maybe I just need him to put the veggies in the oven or like turn the crock pot off. Or, right. You know, it's not just me. Like we are a team. We really support each other. And so if he can help me, he will. We will also, I mean, getting fresh air. That's really like our biggest thing. Like going to the beach, if I can just go to the beach I mean, alone would be ideal, but even with my son like that, I take that as self-care because it's not every day that I can just, I mean, I could, but it's not always a nice day to go to the beach. <laughs> right. <clears throat> now, then, did you learn to ask for help or was it something that kind of comes naturally to you? Because I know that is probably like a, you had these preconceived notions of what a stay at home mom was. And so maybe you had this thought of, oh, a stay-at-home mom is the best job, the easiest job. I shouldn't need help with that. But to get that alone time, you kind of have to be vocal. And, I, and the reason I'm asking is I'm curious if it's generational, like, you know, old school, like that 
people are just more self-aware and are learning to ask for it. After you finish listening to this amazing podcast, be sure to give it a five-star rating. Then go check out the other podcasts in the Podcast Connection Network, including my own, Magic and Metamorphosis. Check us all out. The link will be in the episode's description. That is a great question. And I had to learn. Like I have always been very independent. I can do it all. Watch me do it all until I couldn't do it all. And I definitely had like a little bit of a breakdown and had to talk to my husband. And then it was like, okay, well, why don't you, that's when we came up with a solution of reach out to grandpa and have him come once a week. So now I'm able to text him and schedule, Hey, I need you these dates. Can you do it or not? Same with grandma that has, I had to learn to do that. And then there's also, we have what I call a mom cafe nearby. It's a, a coffee shop that has like a on-site childcare mm-hmm. area for like two hours. So you, know, you can go for a couple hours a day and sit in the coffee shop, do work while your child gets. And you can still watched. check on them because they're there. Yes. You're literally on the same building. So I have to find options Um, and find like ways to have that help, but no, it did not come easy. And and also like, I think, yeah, it is a generational thing because I don't think our parents ever asked for that, but I think our society is so different with what we have to do. Right. And with technology and the way Mm -hmm. like people can get a hold of us at all hours of the day now through various forms. Whereas when we were growing up, like you can only reach your parents if they were at home yeah. when the phone rang, right? It wasn't like me being at the museum and, oh my gosh, I get this email from somebody and now I need to hop on a call. It's less stress. It was, I think it was less stressful. Then. I turn all notifications off. I don't get any badges. <laughs> and I learned that when I worked in a corporate job that, especially if I was on vacation with my family and I would see oh man, I got 27 emails. Oh my gosh, I got a hundred and something emails that I'm going to have to address. So at some point, especially once I left the job, I I don't have any notifications. If I want to know if somebody texts or emailed me, I will intentionally look because I'm 47 and it's, hey, when somebody called and you weren't home, you just weren't home. Yeah. And now we're literally accessible through... Like people even know when you're on social media. So. Yeah, but then it's like an expectation of like, like you have to be available to me because, well, because you have a phone, I expect this availability. And especially with the podcast, as I've gotten deeper into it and a way you promote it, considering it an entrepreneurial adventure, I've definitely set up more structured hours of time that I will work because my daughter's out of school and want to take her to the pool during the daytime and stuff like that. So I might do early morning interviews, late interviews. It just kind of depends, but you've definitely been more conscious and gotten better about even just leaving the phone in the office and going and watching the challenge or survivor with my wife, do something for an hour and be there and be present and I feel like I want to do it even more, set stronger boundaries, but I'm kind of easing into it. But you think it's one of those things that we all definitely have to learn. And especially, like I said, with it being summer and my daughter, I want to make sure I'm present when I do have those hours with her because she's kind of, she's 10. So she kind of does her own thing and he plays with her friends and stuff online. But then there's times that, Hey, like yesterday to be able to go go to Starbucks, take her to Michael's for beads and crafts and stuff like that. And just be present and spend that time. You have to soak that in, right? Because pretty soon she's going to be a teenager and like, dad, I need you to drop me off at the end of the parking lot because I don't want my friends to see you. Right. I know. Like (laughs) you have to like really be able to, yeah, be present because how much longer and she's only with home for the summer. Like, so yeah, it's going to start back up. So, well, you know, I, interestingly I, enough, I'm kind of the stay at home dad. So I podcast and Uber Eats used to do so more. Kind of when I left corporate, my wife's the one who 
goes to a job and actually has to be in physical places. So I'm kind of the stay at home dad. And yes, it is very difficult, a man or woman, you learn that it's, it's never ending, but I enjoy it. I enjoy being able to, my daughter's sick. I'm the one who goes and gets her from school. I'm the one who takes her to the doctor. I'm the one that stays home and even at 10, not fully self, self-sufficient, self she can do quite a bit of things, but you still got to check on them every couple hours to make sure they're okay <laughs> because they're at that age. And with social media, it's a whole different thing. But yeah, I would say, I don't know. Kind of like you said, maybe there should be a better term for what we call stay-at-home parenting. Yeah. Um, I mean, what we're doing is we're we're really raising humans, right? Yeah, and it, and it's it's kind of it's the most important job we'll ever have. Exactly, yeah. because that goes on to them, and then impacting their lives and other people that surround them. Yet somewhere it's, it's... in between, we kind of got away from this. I think there's nothing wrong with it. Like I think the women's movement and women wanting more independence and being CEOs. I think that was great. But then we kind of shifted where maybe we re we relied too much on the raising of our kids to be in a school setting as these things kind of merged and more women went into the workforce. And I think maybe now we're starting to see that it can be either way and be, oh, be balanced but then also, I think the pandemic bringing a lot of remote jobs and whatnot opened up a lot of entrepreneurs to be able to stay at home and work from home and kind of cut down that commute. But I think we're just in a way better position between remote jobs and entrepreneurship that parents are actually having more of that opportunity to do more of the raising of their children by being around them more, by being in the house, by not having to go to an office, not necessarily having to send them to a school for eight hours a day. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I, I didn't, wasn't a parent during the pandemic, but I did teach online and yeah, it was hard because there was a lot put on parents more often than not the mom from like a, a school mm -hmm. perspective, like the first person I would call would be the mom, not the dad. And so now if parents are working from home full time, but also having to keep an eye on the kids that are, like you said, not yet independent enough to really be able to complete all of the tasks without being guided, right? Like having somebody watch over them, not really watch over them, but be present in a room and say, Hey, you, do you need a break? Maybe you need to step out for like five minutes, come back and then get back into your workload. Mm -hmm. But Pro provide it, that structure that school provides kind of naturally. Yeah. And so, I mean, I see more often than not lots of moms that are full-time working moms, full-time work from home moms that are also the full-time stay at home parent. Mm. So they're doing two jobs. So in a way, like there's benefits to that, right? You don't have to pay for childcare, but then as your child get getting the attention and, and all of that stimulation that they need, like, are you able to provide a hundred percent to both? maybe some parents are able to figure it out. If it's not like a, I need to be on the computer from nine to five, I can work whatever hours. Mm -hmm. So it definitely depends on the job itself, the parent, but yeah, it's kind of interesting on like where, what COVID did, right? Like it, I think it opened a lot more opportunities and more flexibility, but I think at the same time, it probably put a lot more pressure on parents that they just didn't have prior. Yeah. Well, because like you said, I think, I think where the, 
the struggle and things can kind of come to a head was that we have a couple of ideas that kind of got mixed together in this bowl of like, you know, women back in the workforce and that independence and then kind of the stay at home mom that is really a full time, more than full time job within itself. And now you have both of those things coming together where maybe maybe the job should be just a stay at home full time parent and not try to do both or do one part time and maybe mm -hmm. full time. But I think kind of like you said, the pandemic, it it opened up some opportunity, but I think it also opened up this time to redefine what we want in a family unit, what we want as a family structure and kind of allowing people to do what works for them. Because I've interviewed some guys on like men's groups and the women's movement and kind of how men are left behind because women came together and did all this stuff for their well-being and to be able to have the equality and be CEOs and be the breadwinners. And men have kind of been left doing the same things we've always done, go to work and come home and contribute what we thought but you know, more is being expected out of men now and we're expected to be there emotionally and contribute in the parenting and, and not just in the way of, I'm going to tell your dad when you're bad, but also in that emotional component. And especially me having all uh, girls, it's, it's definitely different um, in terms how you, how you need to be emotionally as a father. And so I think we're in a very interesting time that we're 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 starting to figure out maybe hey what's best and it doesn't have to be one way or one idea it needs to be what is going to provide the most love the most abundance the most opportunity the most joy for each individual family unit and as long as the family unit's okay and they're raising good humans then that's what we should be striving for versus maybe some sort of system that we had set up from the way it's always been since the forties. And you, and it's taken on many different forms and it, it, you definitely don't see as many stay at home moms as you used to growing up when I was a child. I mean, that was a whole thing. That's what a lot of women did, but that's changed and I think it's continuing to change and hopefully trending in the right direction. Yeah. I mean, I've seen a st statistic, I don't know the exact number, but that mm -hmm. just millennial fathers are much more involved and active in their baby's lives than like our parents' generation was. And it, it that I think is super neat to see because see millennial dads like doing changing the diapers and really like waking up in the middle of the night and doing the feeding whereas I think historically that was not really a, a thing you never really heard about dads changing diapers like when we were babies <laughs> and then you made another really good point about yeah like the the change with stay-at-home moms back then well I think there's a couple of things one now it's much harder to live off of just one income but mm -hmm. but we two, made it that way I don't know why <laughs> we did it to ourselves and then to <clears throat> that depending on who is the breadwinner it's allowing more dads to be the stay-at-home parent because the wife or their partner is the one that's the breadwinner and I, that's great and it's okay I think one downside though is that a lot of groups do tend to focus on just like the moms mm -hmm. and we tend to leave out the dads that stay home <laughs> that can also partake in those activities. Like, hey, you know, I have a two-year-old, like, but I'm a dad. Can I bring can them I have to coffee this? too? <laughs> yeah, have coffee and bring my kid to the sensory class, which in my group I say, yeah, at any caretaker is allowed. Yeah, that's, 
Definitely. I, I know, I think at one time, I don't know if it was a, maybe it was on like TLC or something, but I feel like it was a group of dads out of Austin and it focused on a group of like maybe three or four stay at home dads. It was interesting. It, it, it's been a while though. It is still kind of like whenever you hear stay at home dads, I think we're still a little bit like, Oh yeah. Like it's, it's starting to become a little bit more like, you're not the only one that I know. <laughs> I know of you. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and I, I think about that kind of point of kind of like what you said, like, you know, I mean, yes, we're all a dad or we're all a mom and that's kind of how we're defined. And then you just add that little bit, like stay at home and it kind of changes it like to a different degree. Or even if you thought like, you know, even, even if you thought of in the context of you're talking to somebody and you're talking to a couple, well, what do you do? I do this and I do this and our child goes to daycare and we pick them up and kind of co-parent and that's so normalized. But yet, if you were talking to my wife and I, and I said, well, I'm a stay at home dad, it automatically like kind of shifts this focus to it that it seems so weird or less than normal than two people working and mm -hmm. letting somebody else raise their child. Um, or you're just a stay at home parent, like, oh, then you're, yeah, you that, don't, you that, don't work hard. You don't do very much what we, we all do, right? You're learn there's so much that goes into raising a kid and the amount of information that you need to know and if you are actively seeking that information yourself too like you're, yeah. you're still always <clears throat> learning and gaining the skills that you need to become a better parent well not only that though and typically if you're the stay-at-home person then you're you're usually doing something to propel the family along to whether it's laundry for your spouse who goes to work or cooking dinner or you know, this, that, and the other, yeah. there's so many other things that, you know, kind of like you said that you would think, how could it not all get done? But there's just sometimes so much mm -hmm. to do. Um, and kind of like you said too, you have to, you have to make time for yourself. Um, yeah. And, and then just even with that, point like when it comes to doing laundry you might actively be looking for like what is the best laundry for my child who has sensitive skin how can i like lower my footprint and use sustainable items in the home there's a lot and it takes a lot of searching on the internet to learn about those and the different products out there right so it's still <laughs> not just a Oh, you're just spraying, I don't know, Windex on the windows. Like you might no longer use Windex. <laughs> yeah, there, there's a whole host of challenges. And especially if you ever have a sick child <laughs> that then, you know, it, it's been my daughter. She hates to take medicine. It's just, even though your medicine is going to make you feel better, there's this aversion to taking it and whether it's Used to, we could sneak it into a juice pack. Used to, we could do certain things, but now she's old enough and she'll know. And so getting that to happen and deploying techniques, kind of like you said, giving them options to where they feel like they're in control, mm -hmm. I think has been the key. <clears throat> but yeah, it, and of course, the lessons and the challenges just continue as they evolve through different ages, seems like it's always something. Oh yeah. <laughs> but why, what, where can people find you? I know you mentioned the podcast. Yeah. So my website is newmomtalk.com. Mm -hmm. It's also the name of my podcast. On there, you can find my Instagram, which is at newmomtalk.podcast. If you are in the San Diego area, you can find my mom group at Carlsbad Mom Crew. Um, and that's just on Instagram, but I do have all my events on my website. So yes, please follow, listen, support. You can find my podcast on any platform, any of the podcast platforms. And yeah, 
It's my goal is to provide resources, information in little snippets, like 20, 25 minutes mm -hmm. long for every parent to have a takeaway. Most of my topics are going to be geared towards the mom or the birthing parent, the one that is mm -hmm. nursing. So, or that had is recovering in that postpartum stage, but not everything. So I, I do get into other topics like tantrums, body mm -hmm. training, all of the fun things that go with raising a little human. Now, one thing I like to ask before we hop off is I like to ask everyone, maybe it's kind of neat, but what is one thing unexpected that's happened as a result of this journey of starting the podcast, the mom group, um, kind of where you were to where you are now, uh, what's been one thing that never would have happened had you not started this, that's just kind of blown you away that you're grateful for? I think it's being so passionate about that postpartum stage and the preparation because prior to having my son, I didn't get the whole thing or like the preparation or I, I, I honestly didn't even know what to expect. I didn't understand this whole, like, I didn't find pregnancy enjoyable. I had an easy pregnancy. Did I enjoy it? Not really. There were a lot of things I couldn't do, but <laughs> mm -hmm. I, since having my son creating, which led to the creation of my podcast, which led to the creation of my group has really led me to be passionate about providing just the resources and the connections to help moms out about really preparing for the postpartum stage and not to forget about themselves and to set boundaries and be okay with asking for things like maybe instead of asking for a once you ask for like money that can go to pay towards a postpartum doula or a meal train or maybe have somebody come to your house and do your hair. Just you can't forget about taking care of yourself because that's going to make you feel better, which will then allow you to do a better job of parenting. We often forget that, right? Like our generation, our parents always forgot about taking care of themselves and everything yeah. was about us. And I think we need to shift that. We, we are also humans and they need to see that we're taking care of ourselves Man, yeah, that's definitely evident kind of in what you said that there there was this mental attitude of, hey, it's no longer about you. Nothing's about you. Don't take care of yourself. Don't worry about yourself. But the reality is we, we've started to learn that uh, the more a parent or caretaker can take care of themselves, the better care they're going to provide whether it's to their child, a spouse with an ailment, maybe they're the caretaker for a grandparent or a parent, um, because I've had quite a few interviews with caretakers lately, and <clears throat> it's definitely the theme, and same with parenthood is, especially if you're a couple, try to, try to make some time, give each other some time and space for filling your own cup so you can come into your relationship with your partner and your parenting style on point or as your best self, it definitely makes a difference, but yeah, gotta have that self-care, right? <laughs> that's one of the, the biggest things of the podcast is kind of talking about that self-care and really learning to not feel guilty about it. And if you need help, vocalize it and ask for it. Hence, one of my questions, is that something you're natural at? Um, you know, my wife can be naturally bossy. So, <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes it, you still got to ask for help. And uh, I think as men to understanding what your partner might be going through and what they need as well is definitely key to making it work and making it successful. And then of course, I think making time for each other as well. It's not a marriage counseling session, but I'm sure that's another part of the parenting piece is ensuring that you and your partner have a little bit of downtime together. Right. 
You have to make time for it. We do. Once a month, we have a date night or a day date. <laughs> and and that'll get better as time goes on and um, the child can do more things on their own. <laughs> and of course, it's, it's hard sometimes even if you have the time. Uh, you kind of just want to relax <laughs> or be lazy. Yeah. yeah. And your date can be, I don't know, at home just watching a show together. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you for coming on today and I will I will update the uh, show notes and whatnot for Podmatch to let you know the link, uh, the release date, but should be early July, a couple Great. weeks from now. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me. And when that, when it does come out, if you don't mind sending me a cover of your podcast and the yes. link, then I'll put it on my website as well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I look thank forward you. to getting this out to uh, my wife's best friend. Well, sure. have a great summer. Enjoy time with your daughter. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, that's a wrap. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts from. Remember, go out and be the person that you want to meet. Let's go. Asteroid.